All right. I'm going to give you today a strategic approach that is a way of thinking about the interview, right? Extended way of thinking about it as opposed to tons of specific uh, pieces of, of advice. Uh, I will give a lot of hints along the way, but really, I want to give you a way of thinking about conceptualizing what you're about to uh, go into. Uh, first question is a really important one. What is it that you want? I'm not going to be spending time on that today. The next session, uh, I think, will be really useful uh, along, along those lines. What I'm going to be focusing on is what do we want? That is, those of us who are making these hiring decisions, what do we want? Uh, how do we identify whether what, whether you have what it is that we want? Right? Because you want to you want to get in my head, right? You want to get in my head, and then show us that you have um, you know, that you can, that you can meet those criteria. That, that, that. So what do we want? A new colleague? We want people who are smart. They're driven by theory and they're building theory, right? We want really good scientists. We want people who are going to be really good and productive scientists. So we're looking for the creativity, we're looking for productivity, we're looking for teaching prompts. I vitalize prompts. We don't expect folks to come out and be great teachers. Every one of us here who's been around a while knows that our teaching uh, has developed over, over time, but we want to see promise. Uh, we want interesting and interested playmates, right? These people, you guys, are going to be our colleagues hopefully for a really long time. We want people who we can play with. We'll talk more about what that means later. And we want people with character. Uh, we're social animals, right? There are things that make someone a good social animal. People who are cooperative, people who are pro, uh, people who are pro social, people who you can trust. People who will do their fair share, and uh, you can be—you can hit with aces the previous four, and you fail the character test, and uh, it's over. All right. Well, so how do we identify such folks? Well, we look into a crystal ball, and uh, we answer, "No, we don't." Turns out we don't have a crystal ball, not one that's worth anything. But what we do is that we rely on cues. That is, we don't know how great you're going to end up being. We're guessing, right? They're educated guesses, but we're guessing. And we use a set of cues, sources of information, in order to make, make those guesses. Uh, this is, by the way, what we do whenever we try to, as, as social perceivers, as we move throughout the world anyway. We manage affordances. That is, what we try to do is we try to assess what the opportunities people uh, pose for us, what kind of threats, perils they pose uh, to us. This is the way the mind works. You're just trying to get into the mind of someone who's going to be potentially hiring you for a job. And when we assess affordances out there in the real world, we use uh, we use cues in very heuristic kind of ways. When we assess you as possible colleagues, we're going to be doing the same thing. Uh, your challenge: present favorable opportunities to us and uh, and non potential threats. There's actually a more nuanced, sort of extended version of this that I won't talk about today. If you're really good and you think about this in terms of the framework. We can also sort of alter in our mind what we think the most our most important needs are, right? By showing us something that you can do that fulfills certain needs that we might have that other folks. So, so not just manipulating, you know, whether you give us what we want, but in fact changing what it is we think we want. Uh, but that's that's going a little bit deeper than what I have time for today. All right. So what characteristics do we seek in folks? What cues do we use? Let's start with the first set here. We're looking for intelligent, creative theory, driven theory building researchers. Well. Our first cue comes right off your CV. It's your publication history, right? It's an imperfect cue, all right? Why, why, why is your CV in a, in a perfect cue? Because you've got these pubs, but you've got mentors, and you've got co-authors, and we're never quite sure how much of that is you and how much of that is them, right? You might think that uh, if that was if those were perfect cues, we wouldn't have to interview at all if we just wanted to assess your, your scientific uh, promise. Right? But we don't quite trust that. We don't quite, quite trust that information. Uh, so, and we're gonna, so we're gonna use it. Nonetheless, you can do something about it. With that, doing something about it means the interview's already started. Right? Because you're showing up with a, with a, with a paper record of, of that says something about, about your scientific promise. The interview's already underway. That's, you gotta be working on that now, developing that. And, and at some point, maybe in Q&A or later, we can talk about what a really good CD looks like. 
Well, you've got your job talk presentation, right? So we use that as a cue. Why is that imperfect? Again, I could give a really good job talk on someone else's research that I've had enough practice at, which say absolutely nothing about my own scientific ability, right? So again, the job talk itself, it's, it's necessary. You gotta, you gotta do a good job at it, but it also isn't uh, uh, basically sufficient. But it's necessary, so you gotta do well. We could actually uh, spend a whole session and more on what makes for a great job talk. And I can tell you that with uh, my own students, boy, we prepare over and over and over and over again. Uh, but some of the things are, are uh, just big ideas or things that, in fact, are related to, to good writing. Engage from the very beginning. Is, is your research, is there a mystery sort of embedded in your research, right? People love to read mystery stories, right? People love to listen to them, set it up as a, set it as a mystery. Is there something especially important, this big, huge issue out there, the controversy is hormone? Know that you want to engage folks. They're there, they're sitting in the room, they have to because they're hiring somebody, right? But make them love being there from the beginning. You're telling a story. Right? Your job talk should have a logical narrative flow to it. Uh, it should just move on through. You know, it has, should, there should be a reason that's motivating it. Should, there should be this interesting theory things. You've got to study, which flows into the next study, which flows into the next study. You tell a story uh, with your job talk. Uh, in place of the theoretical context, there are going to be people there who are older. They're going to know stuff at least. You know, you, you don't need to go into history in any deep kind of way. You know a little bit about what that history is. And if you can drop in some that show that you sort of have the context for it, that's great. The other thing is people just don't want findings. They want the findings to mean something bigger. And what we get out of bigger are some of the theories that we generate. Uh, demonstrate rigor. Normally when people think about demonstrating rigor, they're thinking about the methods and analyses, but you've already done that, right? I mean, that the research has done along those lines. I'm talking about sort of rigor in the kind of in a way that you present things. Uh, that say something maybe about your theoretical acumen. And, uh, and how precise you're going to be as a scientist. And I've got this notion of word choice here. Um, this is one of the things I'm a little sensitive to. So I do research on prejudice. Some of my students and I do research on evolutionary approaches to prejudice. Right? There, and, there are, and there are a couple of other uh, ways that if you say something, if you say something in a way that's not really careful, that's not really precise, people who might be looking to misinterpret you, right? people who don't understand the frame can readily do so. Use language, use word choice. Mark's talking about word choice with writing. Word choice is really important as well uh, in, a, in a job talk. And there'll be some, several places, uh, and especially in the job talk, where transitions maybe are a little bit awkward, where you really need to make a point. You have to memorize a couple sentences here, a couple sentences here. If you have to memorize your, your opener to sort of make the thing, then memorize that stuff. You don't need to memorize the talk, right? Be natural. But there's some places where word choice really says a lot about something, at least we think. All right, uh, so we're still working on uh, creating this impression. I've separated out the job talk Q&A from the job talk itself. It's really a different animal, right? I mean, I could give someone else's job talk. I'd, I'd fail miserably in a, in, a, in a good, solid Q&A about that person's research, right? Uh, this is a different thing. This is a different thing. Uh, why is it imperfect as a Q? Uh, because not all great scientists are great uh, under pressure, talk thinking about things on your feet. There's arousal, so we're social psychologists, we know what arousal can do, uh, especially in challenging, unmastered, uh, novel kind of uh, circumstances, which is what a Q&A is. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you, you're going to have a Q&A session, you've got you to prepare, and there are ways that you can prepare. So, uh, Mark was talking about getting feedback on your writing. Get feedback on your talks. Get lots of feedback on, uh, on, on, on the work that you do in general, as well as on the talks. So your paper, you, you likely the, the papers that you're going to be talking about, the work you're going to be talking about, our job interview, has probably been out for review. Take those reviews to heart. Take that seriously. Reviewers aren't just idiots. Sometimes they're idiots. Actually, let me say that. Sometimes we're idiots, right? Because uh, sometimes we probably don't do the best reviews. Uh, we don't quite get something and then and when we're looking at papers. Uh, uh, but any time that someone doesn't get something that you've uh, uh, that you've written, it's your fault. Any time someone doesn't understand what you're saying in a job talk, it's your fault. Uh, so so take the uh, take the uh, take the critiques to heart. Uh, ask your colleagues.
colleagues to drill you, bring other faculty members to your job talks to ask you questions because you're going to be giving job talks in front of a more diverse crowd than just a social psychologist almost always. Uh, you don't want your you don't want your friends, your graduate friends, your colleagues, you don't want them to be your friends. Right? Your colleagues' friendliness isn't your friend. Right? You want them to go after you, right? Because you want to be prepared. You want to be prepared for questions that are going to come out of the blue. You don't want to be prepared for people really not buying into what you're saying and sort of pushing you hard on it so you know how to do it, so you know how to respond. Uh, a couple just little hints. Oftentimes you'll get a question in the Q&A that you won't understand what the hell that person's asking. Right? I mean, I think every one of us who's, who's, who's done that, I, mean, I, I remember these. I remember the question. Uh, uh, if you don't know what the question is, don't answer it. Right? Don't answer a question you're not sure what it is. Repeat the question as best as you understand it back in your own words. Say, I just want to make sure that I'm uh, that I'm tracking right. So you're at, you're at, you're suggesting that maybe blah 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 blah. And then let, wait for that person to say yes, and then answer that question. Right? Answer answer that question. Uh, you know. Oh, by the way, if you don't understand a question that's coming your way, half the other uh, faculty members in the class don't understand the question. Uh, but you can you can really you can really go astray trying to answer a question that you don't know, that you don't. Uh, this is one of the things that impresses me the most in a in a job. Right? Someone, uh, someone gets a challenging question, and there is no answer. That is, you can, uh, that you don't know what it is. You can say, you know what, I've got this data. And if we do, if we look at this in the data, we might be able to differentiate between my position right here and the one you're suggesting. Better yet, you know, let's think about a study. You know, for example, maybe if what we did is we brought them in and we did the same thing, but instead of this manipulation, we sort of did it this way, then we'd be able to pick these two different things apart and we measured what, you know what I like? Boy, when I see that, you know what I see? I see a scientist. Right? I see someone who's doing science and, and she's, she's doing it right in front of me, right? That's great. Uh, if there's something where you sort of don't know what the, you don't have a great answer, you say, you know what, I really want to think about this some more and, uh, and hopefully I have a chance to follow up with you later, uh, later today or tomorrow. Uh, and if not, send me an email. Do follow up. Again, you're being a scientist, right? Because you want to know the answers. You want to know the right answers. You're not just invested in protecting what you just presented up there. You want to know, demonstrate that you want to know the answers. Okay. Uh, faculty student meetings, uh, they're also imperfect. Sometimes the chemistry just isn't right or people are sometimes awkward. Sometimes people ask questions or talking about their own work and they won't do a very good job protecting it. Uh, and so sometimes these aren't the uh, greatest, but they're great opportunities for you uh, if you prepare. You should have a one-minute elevator talk. You go into a meeting with someone from a different discipline. Uh, you know why they call it the elevator talk, right? So you're on the 30th floor. You by the time you get down to the bottom, if you have a one-minute version of this, that's sort of really good. You have to know it. It's hard to make up on the fly. Then you have a five-minute expanded version. That is something where if stuff is going well, you get the head nods. The person seems interested. You can expand it. It's not you starting all over, right? The the, the next four minutes have to now. It's like you give the abstract, and now you're just going to go into uh, a couple days ago, uh, in my lab group, uh, Friday afternoon, uh, the student, my grad students were coming to the conference. Uh, we were presenting this stuff to our undergrads about, you know, one of the students uh, that's given a, a symposium presentation, so we spent most of the time talking, with, uh, talking about her presentation, giving feedback, and we spent less time on the students had posters. And when it came down to the last student, and there were four minutes left, and I turned to her and said, well, you want to do this or not? I said, okay, I'll do it. She gave the best four-minute presentation of a three-study paper involving archival stuff around the world, archival stuff in the state, and a manipulation of the same constructs. Four minutes, it was beautiful. It was the best version of something like this I'd ever, ever read. Right? But it takes work. I don't think she actually worked on it. I was ready to hire her. Right? <laughs> I'd say, yeah, you can work here. Uh, it takes work. Uh, when you're meeting with faculty, you know their work. You don't have to know it deeply, right? Then no one's going to expect you to read a paper or two and lay scan through. And if you can have sort of a question in your back pocket at the ready, in case you know the conversation uh, isn't quite isn't quite going well, you say, you know, I read this paper of yours and I was wondering about. If I'm understanding it right, you're making this right, but I was wondering about. Well, that's great. You're interested in them, and you're showing your scientists. You're curious, right? You're curious and you're engaging them. When you're meeting with students, which you'll do, ask about their work. There are a lot of good reasons. For that listen to what they have to say and then probe. Do the, you know, be the be the scientist you are. Probe. Show them as well they're interested in, in ideas. Oh, 
what about this dimension of research productivity? Again, you know, so we look at the CV again, and now counting clubs and conference presentations and things as opposed to just looking at their quality. Uh, again, uh, this isn't perfect because again, you've been working in someone's lab, but also because we don't know how the program is going to turn out. This is what we've done so far, but I'm not hiring you on your past. I'm hiring you on your promise for the future, right? And, and this is just going to be, this is just uncertain. What can you do? Well, you can be explicit. Uh, about the programmatic nature of your work. Instead of letting, assuming that people are going to infer that what you're doing is programmatic, lay it out there for them. You can lay it out in the talk. You can, you can expand on it in the q and the like. Uh, you can discuss, you can just raise, not too much, you have to be careful unless you've got a grant proposal nearly in hand, the possibilities of a grant proposal. Uh, I was able to do that in my job interview because I was in the midst of a postdoc, and one of the things that uh, my postdoc, a mentor, so you say, well, why don't you start, why don't you start thinking about a grant proposal? I mean, maybe, maybe, that, that, maybe that'll be what really comes out of this, this year for most time. Uh, and it was great because I was able then to sort of talk about the next four or five years of work that looked like on that particular line. Uh, discuss other research that you're doing. Sometimes, you know, where Brian students often work with mobile, typically work with mobile faculty members, and they have different lines of research. And you know, you sort of want to let people know that you're doing all these different things, and sometimes it's hard to integrate. We spend a lot of time on job talks trying to think about how we can integrate some of these multiple lines together and, and keep a good narrative, a good story. Uh, but sometimes what you can just do it towards the end of a talk and say, and so, so this is where this is where I'm at with this. I just want to let you know that a couple of the things that I'm doing, you sort of pull up some things, maybe you got they're published, I think they're better, you put them in some patient next or whatever. Uh, sometimes you can you can uh, Near start a talk like that, not the very beginning. You want to grab folks at the beginning, right? And say, so this is this is what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, and then you can uh, uh, you can say, well, you can grab them with a mystery. You can then pop up your your actual title slide. And you can say, I do a lot of different things, blah 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 blah. What I'm going to focus on today, though, is, is answering that question that I just raised. So they're just ways of getting people said that you uh, that you like to be productive. You've got multiple programs of research. If you're an energetic person. Don't mask it, hide it, right? You know, energy, expressiveness, that is going to be taken as a cue, whether appropriate or not, as someone who's going to have energy when it comes to knocking out, knocking out research, right? Uh, it's a heuristic cue. If you're energetic, don't feel like you, you're at an interview and you got to sort of close yourself in. Be that energetic person. All right. Uh, in your meetings, use your meetings to extend your presentation, right? So if people want to know that you're productive, you can be talking about, here I've done this stuff, and this is where, again, this is where I'm going. It's just like the notion of a, uh, of a uh, proposal. Uh, you can use those meetings to talk about other work that you're doing, right? Uh, if, sometimes you'll have these meetings, and you'll end up having these great conversations with folks, and it'd be clear that if you showed up at this place, it would make total sense for you guys to collaborate on something. That's the case, but it's natural. Bring that up, except we sort of fun to collaborate. Again, it shows that you're thinking in terms of productivity, you're going to see in that way. Teaching potential. Uh, again, you can look at someone's CV, you can see what their teaching experiences have been. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes you'll have your evaluations in there. Uh, that's all great. Again, anything based on the CV means that the interview's already started. Right? That that information that's really important for, for your interview uh, already needs to be there. Of course, it's. Uh, uh, you know, imperfect. Just the fact that you've taught a whole bunch of classes doesn't mean that you taught them well, right? And so uh, we're not sure exactly what to make of that. You know, the student evaluations can be biased, right? And people who are really liked uh, and are really easy often get really good evaluations, right? But that's not necessarily what we're looking for uh, when we're hiring folks. Uh, so the CV is really going to be seen as diagnostic. So what can you do? Well, now you can get some teaching experience. I say some, and and and. And you guys may have noticed I'm, I'm focusing here more on sort of research-oriented jobs. Uh, uh, and some of these things will be a little bit different, maybe some other jobs, and maybe we'll have some conversations about that you know, with the next, uh, with the next session. Uh, so get some teaching experience. And take advantage of the fact that you have this experience. As have someone who's well-respected in, in your program, in the department. Ask them to do you the favor of coming on in one day while you're teaching, observing, and giving you feedback value, right? Become a better teacher, right? The fact that you're in there and you're doing it in front of students, if you're not getting good feedback, you're not having people sort of look at what you're doing and giving you the kind of stuff, uh, it's going to be a much slower uh, road in terms of
terms of becoming good. So, so you have to keep adding in if you're applying for a teaching job or a job which, then get that person to write you a letter. And you know what? Most people are really nice. The person who, in fact, is one of the best teachers in your department likes teaching. They like students. They like you, even though you don't know it yet. And so they're going to be flattered. They're going to come in. They're going to do. They're going to listen to you. Uh, give a give a lecture. They're going to give you feedback, and then they're going to be happy to write you the letter based on that. Uh, uh, what other care? Well, we use the job talk presentation and the Q and A also as an indicator of teaching. Why? Because the job talk is teaching. They're teaching you when you're giving a job talk. You're teaching folks you know more than they do about what it is you're talking about, right? Almost by definition. If not, they've got no reason. Right, they have no reason to hire you if you don't have stuff. So the job talk is teaching. So this is this is a great opportunity to show you that teaching potential. So, like you like you want to be in a classroom, like you want to be in your papers, like you want to be interesting, you want to be organized, you want to be clear. Uh, how you do in the Q and A? Your style, not not the substance, but the style suggests how you might deal with both interested and troublesome students. Just because you've got interested and troublesome faculty members. Uh, sitting there uh, at your job talk, right? So what kind of style do you have when someone really challenges you? What kind of stuff? You know, how much are you encouraging? Asking people to expand on their questions. You know, uh, giving the feedback. Wow, that's really interesting. So are you suggesting that a well, right? I mean, the kind of thing that you do if you're doing a great job. Uh, in your meetings with grad students in particular, uh, they're going to they're draw inferences about, you know, how you meet with them, what that's going to what that going to make you look like as a mentor, right? Uh, so they're going to be, um, you listen, right? You're not, so you can do You can say, well, I'm interviewing. You listen to me. No, 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 no. You're meeting with students. They're thinking about you as being a potential mentor for them, right? And mentor for the students who are coming after them. You have to be the mentor in there. You listen. You're interested. You're constructive, right? You're creative. You're encouraging. Okay, playmates. I'm doing fine. Uh, this, this is actually. This, this may be the, one of the most important things. Yes, we want people who are great researchers, but you know, there, there are a lot of times, I mean, I'll be at a job call for someone in a different area, and you know what? They're doing something on sort of word processing and whatever, you know, and, and I'm not all that interested. But if they're interested, and they, they like talking across areas, then that's a person, boy, I have to go out to lunch, I can go grab a beer with this person. This is sort of fun. You know what? I'll let them decide the substance, but boy, this person's going to be a good playmate. So uh, we use, the, to make inferences about whether people be good playmates, we use the job talk presentations, Q&A meetings. Uh, remember why you decided to become a scientist, right? We're all smart. We're all ambitious. We work hard. We're willing, we, we take the long view of things, but we're, we're willing to put off immediate gratification for long range things. We'd be really successful out there doing tons of different things. You could be doing tons of different things, but no. You're being a scientist. You're a scientist because you're curious, because you want to know how things work. You want to know why things are the way that you are, right? Be that person, you know, while you're on the interview, right? Be interested in what people do and play with ideas. You know what? At an interview, you're allowed to have fun. You actually are. You know, we, I think we conceive of this thing as something that's just all stress. Oh my God, I can't wait for it to be over. You know when you know you've had a really good interview? When you leave at the end, you say, yeah, my body is tired. Last uh, thing I'm going to focus on here, last to mention, this idea of, uh, of, of good character. Uh, so important, so important. What are the keys to this? Everything, right? Everything. Not just during your visit, right? You're at conferences, right? You're making decisions while you're at conferences. You have a web presence. Right? Maybe we'll talk about that just a little bit. You have a, you have a web presence, right? Everything is related to, to people. Uh, assessments of your uh, of your uh, character. Uh, I mentioned this before: feeling the perceived character test means feeling the uh, you know, The most important dimension, uh, you know, for a social animal is trustworthiness. Right? If people can't trust you, then, then nothing else, nothing else really matters. Right? Uh, 
So just be straightforward in your interaction. You'll be asked, you'll be asked questions. You know, if someone, if someone asks you where else you're interviewing, tell them, right? They could find out anyway. Just show that you're, that you're trusting them enough with the information that you're trustworthy uh, yourself. Just be, just be straight with them. Just be straight with them. Uh, you know, these are all basic things, you know. Uh, you're a grown-up, right? You're not, you, you go there, you think you're still like a student or whatever. No, 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 they're bringing you in to be a grown-up, just like them. In real life, you make eye contact with people. Uh, dress respectfully. Uh, obvious. These other things, don't gossip. Sometimes people ask, oh, you know, how's this person back at the, back in your home department doing? Or, geez, I remember whatever. Uh, you don't gossip, and you don't say anything negative about anything. Because you know what? If you say, if, if someone talks about, well, you know, uh, it looks like you've had a little drop off in productivity, and, say, and, and it's because your advisor, you know, ran off with somebody and hasn't been around or something. You know what? <laughs> you don't talk about it, right? Because if you, if you criticize people, you talk negatively, what are they going to think you're going to be doing when you show up? Same thing, right? No one owes you anything, right? Be appreciative of the opportunity that you have. Be polite. Open doors for people. Use please and thank you. If you're wandering past some place and you're having a cup of coffee with someone while a meeting, offer to pay, right? Don't, they won't let you probably, right? But don't presume, right? Be, just be a good, polite, gracious uh, uh, person. Uh, learn local norms. This is sometimes hard to do, uh, but there are uh, multiple cases that come to mind immediately for me where people not knowing what the norms were for startup, for example, because you'll be negotiating some stuff, loose negotiating stuff while you're there, don't know what local norms are, don't know what kind of space other folks have, that if you go in sort of presumptive, presuming things, you, you would want to ask for a little bit more than probably what you get, because maybe a little bit more they're ready to offer, right? Because maybe you can get a little bit more in the room. But you can't be so far off the norms that you just look uh, uh, just the way I want to use. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it a presumptuous, presumptuous. Uh, right? So try to get some sense of what the local norms are. Your mentor should be helpful in that. And you can have conversations. When you go, if you go to an interview, try to make sure they schedule, we can schedule you with, uh, to meet with other young folks, people who they've just hired. Have conversations with those folks about things. They'll likely be very open with you uh, about it. Don't pose, because we're not good at it. <laughs> you know? uh, we're just not good at it. If you, and if you're really good at it, you're psychopathic, not paying attention to <laughs>
but just family. Again, you don't know how things are going to work. You know, if you're into power bars, protein, whatever, piece of fruit or something, you know, keep it in your keep it in your briefcase, keep it in your uh, in your uh, in your purse or whatever, whatever bag you've got, just in case, just in case. Uh, and dinner. So you're going to go out to dinner, and some of these folks may drink seriously, right? Or they're just having a good time, and they're ordering a second or a third glass of wine, or they've got a couple bottles on the table or something like that. One glass of wine, nursed throughout the two-hour dinner. That's my piece of advice. Uh, maybe if the norms are certain, maybe, maybe a second thing. Uh, you, one of the things here is you always err on the conservative side of things, right? If you're going to make a mistake, Make a mistake by, you know, under drinking them and, and under drinking, right? And, and having them think, ah, oh, you know, he's on an interview, he's really sensitive to this thing, as opposed to uh, trying to stick with them, right? <laughs> uh, never, never a good idea. Plus, they're probably they're doing, they're probably better than you anyway. Uh, follow up. This is part of the politeness thing. This is part of showing that you're interested in the ideas. But when you get back afterwards. There's, there'll be some people you've had, you've had uh, especially in you know, intense or long conversations with, uh, send them an email. If you enjoy talking with them. You know, hopefully you'll be able to follow up on them. And then there's maybe a substantive issue that you were chatting with. Uh, you know, look forward to seeing them now. <coughs> Certainly the person who is the chair and the members of the, of the search committee. Uh, just, a, just a polite little, uh, polite little note. Uh, be prepared for yourself to be started. Again, think about this all strategically, right? Uh, what we're going to, uh, there's a frame here. The individual circumstances are going to vary a little bit. Uh, and, and, and for some kind of jobs, maybe a lot more. But I think those five dimensions are pretty close for most jobs. They'll be, weighed, they'll be weighted differently in different kind of places. Uh, uh, but think about it as a way of saying, what are they looking for? What cues do they use to assess that? What can I do, honestly, legitimately, being who I am, right? So it comes, so it actually works, so it's actually natural. What can I do to show them that, that I'm that person, right? Uh, and so think strategically in that kind of way. Uh, this is about, I couldn't figure out what number to put in here, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it said, this is 75% of the interview picture. Why? Because you're also interviewing us, right? And sometimes I think you forget that, right? That you're also interviewing us. You want us to give you the job, but you have to then decide where it is you're going to go. And hopefully you've got multiple choices, right? You're interviewing us. And that's that's a different conversation. There's a lot of things you want to know about there. Mark, in fact, might be particularly good at talking about that stuff. So just do it. Okay, what? <laughs> yes, got job. All right, thank you very much.